So the section for 1.1 has to be separated into multiple days because it's a pretty lengthy section. Um, the, the original portion was talking about functions and different components and vocabulary concepts for functions themselves. And for this part, we're going to um, specifically look at piecewise functions and not just graphing piecewise functions, but writing piecewise functions um, from a real world problem, which is really the whole point of them because, you know, who goes around graphing piecewise functions for no reason. <laughs> so these are going to be a little challenging, so kind of hang with me. Um, we have to really think about what's going on at any given moment of time, which is going to be our domain for most of these problems. All right, so the first question is about tipping, and a restaurant patron has decided to leave a 15% tip for any meal that costs up to $40. Cheapskate. An 18% tip for a meal that costs less than 40 or at least, sorry, at least 40 but less than 100 and then a 20% tip for meals that cost 100 or more. So we're going to write a piecewise function, which they're going to call d of c. I already did it, so you don't control that. Um, and then you're going to use c to represent the meal's cost as your um, independent variable. So the, there's three different price points as far as tipping goes. And the first one is if your cost of your meal is cost up to $40, but it doesn't include the $40. So as far as the restriction for this piece of the piecewise function, the cost has to be less than $40. And then it wants us to describe how much the patron will pay. And it's worded a little vaguely. Um, I assume they meant like total pay. So what happens is if you add in tip, you take 100% of the bill plus the 15% or the 20% of the bill itself. So that's like 115% or 118% and so on and so on. So for the first piece, it would be 15% tip, so that would be 115% times whatever the cost of the bill was before you added a tip. So for piecewise functions, we separate the function component from the restriction, usually with the word if. Uh, it's, sometimes it's a semicolon, whatever makes you happy. All right, the next piece of the piecewise function is for meals costing at least 40 but less than 100. So in this case, the cost of your meal has to be at least 40 but less than 100. So it's a sandwich set up here. Now it doesn't say including 100, it has to be less than 100, but at least 40 indicates that $40 and up is what they're referring to. So in that case, you'd tip 18%. So we'd write that as 118% of the cost. And then um, the last piece of the piecewise function is if you're uh, going to have a meal that costs $100 or more. So the cost would be greater than or equal to 100, and in that case, 20%. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's cheap. All right, <laughs> if the cost is greater than or equal to 100. That's all I wanted. Now, um, obviously, you're not going to write a piecewise function in this real-world situation, but if you were trying to program something, um, an app for a phone, perhaps, you know, this is something that you might want to think about because computers understand algebra um, and that sort of language, and that's how they work. So a relevant domain is the part of the domain that's relevant to the particular model. So for us, you wouldn't go, like in this last example, you wouldn't say like um, a meal that costs $2 because like unless you're at McDonald's, you're not going to find a meal that costs $2. So that's not part of their domain at all, technically. Um, so consider the function in which the output is a function of its length. It is unreasonable to have a negative length. So you have to think about where you want to um, cut off your relevant domain. You don't have to worry about all real numbers in these questions because they're real world. So, phone is going off. I'm worse than you kids. All right, the speed v of a vehicle in miles per hour can be represented by the following piecewise function. This is a nice problem that I, I think we kind of yanked from your book. So find the speed of the vehicle at the indicated time. So they're using v to represent speed, also known as velocity. That's a function of um, time. So if um, the time in seconds is between 0 and 15, in, including both endpoints, it's represented by 4t. And then 6t, if it's between 15 and 240, not including the endpoints. And then it's represented by negative 6t plus 1500. Uh, if your time is between 240 and 250 seconds, including the endpoints. So this last question, uh, this first part of the question is they want you to evaluate the speed of the vehicle um, at any particular time. So for five seconds, that falls within the first piece of the piecewise function. 
So four times five would be 20 miles per hour. Oh, you know what? I think this has a cover. All right. So for 15, be careful because it is not including in this bottom function, so you're back up to this top function. So four times 15 produced an output of 60 miles per hour. And then 245 would be included in this last piece of the specialized function. So evaluating 245 at negative 60 plus 1500, apparently it's 30. Okay. <laughs> and they want us to graph this, which I'll have to make some room here. It's not going to be pretty. All right. So um, if we think about the relevant domain here, it doesn't go before. Like you wouldn't do anything smaller than zero because you know, no Michael J. Fox back in time. That would not have the X at that time, right? All right, so we're going to be measuring time along this axis and heat along this axis. And I should put a little bit of it would be nice if I had like coordinate plane markings. You know, I probably could have pulled up a tool from the smart file. Yeah, next time. All right, so looks like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bake this. All right, so 0 to 15. So here's 0. Let's pretend 15 is right here. Um, the speed is measured at 4t as a function. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in, because this is linear, the two endpoints there, and I'm just going to play connect the dots. So when t is 0, I get 0. So that's the first endpoint. And then when t is 15, plug that in, that gave me 60. So um, remember how this speed measurement as you go on the model it's going to keep declining so i'm going to say 60 i'm just going to randomly throw it up here if you don't mind so like this will be like 30 here clearly zero here clearly right uh this would be 45 in the middle It'll be 15 right here okay so the next endpoint 15 16. notice i used filled in circle there ah Oh, so close. Right. So it's supposed to be a straight line. All right, the next part of the function between 15 and 240 um, is it's going to be a, a constant speed of 60 miles per hour. So on the time axis, 15 to 240, let's get that cruise control or something, right? And then we'll say like 250s over here. Get to that in a minute. All right, so a constant speed of 60 miles per hour for that middle piece. So from here to here. And for now, I'm going to put a open circle. I have a feeling it's going to get filled in in a second, but let's find out. All right, so for my last piece of the piecewise function, I did the wrong color. Negative 60 plus 1500 at 240 seconds. Throwing a 240 in right there. Um, negative 6 times 240 plus 1500. I think it's 60, but I better double check. <sighs> All right, negative 6 times 240 plus 1,500. All right. would be bad if it didn't come out because all of a sudden that would have been like a magic trick on your car. All right, so right here. And then I think we did, oh, no, we never evaluated at 250. So negative 6 times 250 plus 1,500. Um, I think it's 48, but let's double check. Negative 6 times 250. 1500. Well, that's zero. Oh, duh. Huh. <laughs> All right. So um, down here it comes back to zero. Because you know what? You probably stopped your car. Oh, numbers. All right. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Very consistent driving. Too bad I can't graph. All right. Triathlon. Okay. This, I want to warn you this problem is really complicated because you have to think about all the different components going into the triathlon. First of all, there's three parts to the triathlon. Each one of the parts is a different rate. Um, they're going to want us to graph in terms of time, which they actually haven't told you anything about the time yet. We have to calculate that, and then we have to convert it all and understand that this is like a continuous function where you, um, you're you going to describe your distance that you've traveled. So remember, every time, every moment that you move on in the triathlon, your distance from your starting point is increasing and increasing and increasing, or at least your distance traveled. So we'll get to that fun in a second. So three parts of the triathlon. We'll call this our first part, our second part, and our third part. I don't run names. I just assume that's how they work. All right, so we have our um, speed for each of them, which is 
super consistent because I guess we're really well trained. And then the distance that we're expected to travel for each of those legs is given up here in the problem. So I'm gonna add like another column here where I'm gonna write distance. And then I could tell from kind of reading ahead in the problem where it says time, I'm gonna have to calculate something for time as well. So let's go ahead and add to this table. All right, woo. All right, let's do this. So for the first leg here, we're swimming at four miles per hour. The distance that we swam is 2.4 miles. So if you want to calculate how much time it takes you to do something as far as traveling, distance equals rate times time. So if you rearrange that equation for time, you solve for t, you would divide the r over to the other side of the equation. So distance divided by rate is how you would calculate time. So doing that, with like the first leg, 2.4 divided by 4 um, ends up being 0.6 of an hour, which I think they want us to travel. Let's we'll throw a label on. It doesn't hurt, right? Um, which means I probably should have. Yeah, miles per hour, miles per hour. Duh. All right. So then this next leg of the, the trip is 20 miles per hour. So the distance for biking was 112 miles. Gross. Like, why would you do that? All right, 112 divided by 20 comes up to 5.6 hours. Thank you. All right, and then the last leg of the trip um, is let's see, running at six miles per hour. And we have to do a, a distance of 26.2 miles. Bless your heart if you do this. All right, so 26.2 divided by six comes out to approximately, or maybe exact, I don't remember, 4.4 .4 hours. Okay, so we have to think about this. This doesn't mean like I'm done running at 4.4 .4 hours. If I were to add up all these times, that is like my total time that I've been traveling, right? So for the first leg of the, of the trip, it's 0.6 of an hour, and you've traveled so far, right? Um... So it's 0.6 of an hour, and you have went, like you've traveled 2.4 miles, right? So then for the next leg of the trip, you've traveled 0.6 of an hour plus the 5.6 of an hour. So you've traveled 6.2 hours once that second leg is finished. Um, and then the distance, the total distance is 114.4 miles. And then after you, fin you know, when you finish the race, after the third leg, um, it's like boggled my mind. Okay, so we've traveled another 4.4 .4 hours, so that's 10.6 hours. Ugh. Uh, and for distance, 114.4 plus 26.2 is, I think, so I'm just 140.6 okay. <laughs> miles. Why? Why would you do that? All right. Um, so this is the end right here. End right here. We're going to need to kind of keep that in mind because we're accumulating time and distance as we move on. So they first want us to write a piecewise function to describe the distance that Jesse has traveled at any given moment in time. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, but whatever they want it. Round to the nearest tenth. Okay. State the domain of the function. Um, the domain is measuring the time. So I've already kind of calculated here that the time for her race starts at zero seconds. <laughs> and she ends hours, excuse me, and she ends at 10.6 hours. So that's as far as our our graph would have to show. It wants me to write the piecewise function, and I think I have more room coming up here. Um, but I think I'd prefer to actually graph this first, if you don't mind. And it doesn't have to be super duper duper like well graphed. Thank goodness. Um, so starting time zero, and we're going to be ending here at time 10.6. So there was kind of markings along the way. Where you know I switched the leg, I Jesse switched the leg of the triathlon. Yeah, there's no way I'm doing this right. So the first time like things switched up was at 0.6 of an hour, and it's probably not going to be close to scale, but that's okay. And then the next time when the second leg ended, I think that was what like 6.2 was it? 6.2, okay. So like here, and then finally she finished the race at 10.6 hours. So we're going to do some sketching, and it's not going to be real pretty, but um, if I wanted a really accurate one, you're, you're looking at the wrong the wrong lady for a really accurate graph. So the first leg of the trip, um, she was going four miles per hour. Um, 
we should talk about what we're measuring along the other axis though. So distance being measured here. I think I kind of already figured out those marks, right? So like the first distance marking was 2.4 and the last one 140.6. So um, let's call this guy up here 140.6. And then 2.4 would be like, you know, not really that high. <laughs> I'm going to go back here. 114.4 is one of my other markings, like right here. Okay. So I've, I know that's not like any sort of beautiful subdivision of the axes. I don't really care, frankly. <laughs> All right. So the first part was remember the swimming part. Um, and it needs to end at a vertical height on this axis of 2.4 because we're measuring the distance, right? So from uh, zero to here sounds good to me. Oh, man. In theory, right? That was supposed to be a segment. It didn't work. All right, the next part picks up right here, but then it's going to have to get up to here at 6.2. So I need to play connect the dots again, right? Now, if I actually drew this to scale and did like a good job with a ruler, you would see that the biking, like the slope of the biking segment is going to be very like less steep than the Sorry, the swimming is going to be less steep than the biking one because your rate of change, your speed is much faster. And then for this next part, we're going to pick up here and then we got to make it to here. So, again, <laughs> oh, these are all supposed to be segments. Nice job. Oh, goodness. But um, assuming you can actually graph well, notice that as long as you understood where you were at any moment in time, at least like when things changed up in the race, it wasn't that difficult to grasp. But now I think we can go back and come up with the function itself. So uh, when we talk about the times of which, you know, your speed and your function was changing, those were um, what I already marked along the x-axis here, the independent axis. So I'm going to go ahead and set up my restriction. And it says, let's see, the first one was, remember, we restricted our domain. We don't want to go negative. So if your time is between 0 and 0 0.6, and um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it an open endpoint on the 0.6. Okay. We are, what are we doing? Swimming there. So your swimming rate was 4 miles per hour. So it would be 4 miles per hour multiplied by how many hours you traveled uh, via swimming which we already know the answer to that for the end of it. Um, but if you wanted to know a certain moment in time, like, I don't know, like 20 minutes into the race, I want to know exactly where you're going to be so I can go and wave at you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why you do that. All right, the next part of the problem, this is going to be a little challenging, right? So the distance that you've traveled is going to be calculated by, um, it's 20 miles per hour, right? But you're not going to just multiply it by how much time you've traveled because you have to multiply by how much time you've traveled just on this biking component. So you have to take away the 0.6 of an hour that you've already biked. Like, for instance, if you've been going at this race for like two hours, like from beginning to now, you haven't been biking the whole time. You've been biking for two hours, but minus that 0.6 hours that you were swimming at the beginning. So, and this is between time of 0.6 and 6.2. Okay. And it's kind of deceptive, like the equal to symbol, because if I put an equal to symbol here, they're going to meet up at the same point. So if you put both equal to symbols on every single part of the restrictions, it's actually okay. Oh, but I forgot something. Um, remember how we traveled, we already traveled to 2.4? I need to incorporate that right here, plus 2.4. Sorry about that. So the total distance was the 2.4 miles that you already took care of when you're swimming, plus all this additional um, biking that you've done. And then, for, for real fun here, <laughs> now we're running at 6 miles per hour, right? Totally. Um, but you've already traveled for 6.2 hours, so whatever the current time is, you got to take away the 6.2 hours that you've already been traveling. And then remember, after the second leg, you had already traveled 114.4 miles. You have to remember to incorporate that back into your function for distance. And this is if your time is greater than or equal to, uh, oh, no, 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 no. I need to back up because we're not going to be doing this triathlon from now until the end of time, right? So your time is going to be between 6.2, but remember we stopped the triathlon at 10.6 because, you know, we finished. 
I have no desire to do a triathlon. Oops, get out of there. Get out of there, Faith. All right. Uh, 10.6. Oh, boy. All right. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I'm going to make you do a whole lot of ones that are that complicated, but that was an excellent problem. Um, if you feel like your future might be in like computer programming, this should kind of speak to you because you're taking you know, something that like you understand as a human, but if you want to explain it to something that's not human, your computer, um, you have to put it in language that it understands. All right, so this one's kind of fun. Rate of change, we've done rate of change on quadratic functions before, and it's just asking you from like point A to B, how fast is the function increasing or sometimes decreasing? And it's really just a slope calculation. It is a, it's a concept that you're gonna see a lot in um, calculus, and there's other ways to calculate rate of change, and it's a very important concept in calculus. So for now, we're just gonna go through the algebra of it. And it's one of those things that's like amazingly easy when you get to calculus, because you're like, oh, I've done this in so many different ways. So, if you want to know the rate of change between um, point A and B for X, you need to evaluate the function at both B and A, and then you need to calculate essentially what is slope. So remember, F of B, F of A, those are just the functions evaluated at those values. So, this is the same thing as saying like Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So, the way we notate our, our setup, we can either use function notation or you can revert back to ordered pair notation. And that's usually what I do. So for this function, which happens to be linear, so this will be an exact calculation. Um, the rate of change from x equals 3 to x equals 8. So I need to figure out the outputs for f of 3 and f of 8. So, all right, if I plug in a 3 right here, that'd be 9 minus 4, so that's 5. And if I plug in an 8 right here, that would be 20. So now when we go to calculate rate of change, which I'm going to abbreviate like this. So using our rate of change formula, um, function evaluated at 8 was 20, right? So 20 minus 5 over 8 minus 3. So exactly the same thing as slope. This becomes 15 over 5, which means the rate of change from the point x equals 3 and x equals 8 is 3. Whatever the unit is, they don't tell me. All right, so for this one, this is a quadratic function. So if I want to know the rate of change between x equals 2 and 4, um, I don't know exactly what this quadratic looks like, so I'm just going to kind of make it up, but, you know, something like this. And for x equals 2, that would be like this point right here, and x equals 4 would be like this point right here, and I want to know rate of change. So if we were going to connect a line between, you know, wherever these points evaluate at, the slope of that line is going to be the average rate of change. It's not necessarily like a really great predictor when you're really far away from the points, like 2 and 4 aren't really close. But if you went like 2 to 2.0001, those are very, very close together. And your average rate of change is going to be something more closely related to the calculus value that you would get using calculus. Anywho, I digress. So I like to write these as ordered pairs. X equals 2, X equals 4. By the way, the other way to write this, um, would be like you'd say f of 2 equals f of 4 equals, and then you have to kind of um, do the calculations just like we're about to do. So plugging in a 2 here and here would be 4 plus 12 minus 10, 6, right? Still have to check my math. It's really so hot today. And then, um, so if you're using this other notation, you'd say f of 2 is 6. And then plugging in a 4 gives you 16 plus 24 minus 30. So other notation, you could use that. Either way, you have to calculate the rate of change using the same formula. So 30 minus 6 over 4 minus 2. And what was that 24 over 2, which is 12. So if we were, if we were like able to use calculus, that would not be a very accurate answer um, for the rate of change at like x equals 2 or x equals 4 separately. Um, we would have to get closer together to get a more accurate calculus description. So here's a nice visual um, from this particular concept from your book. So the little curvy doohickey here. So this is your function. <laughs> that guy there. Oh, kind of missed. And I... anyways, that one. <laughs> so 
if they want to calculate the average rate of change from a point to a point, they happen to choose these graphically designed random points here. Notice it's not like close to what the curve is doing. The curve kind of dips down and lines don't dip. So, okay. you like that calculus there? Pretty cool. It's weird. It's weird yeah. uh, so the question they have for you is, is the average rate of change um, greater between 0 and 1 or between 4 and 5? So for this particular problem, they're referring to a very boring parabola. So, oh boy, can't grab it. There's a parabola. And if you think about a parabola between 0 and 1, like here and here, if I think about drawing a line between those two blue points, I have um, not a super high slope line, but I have a line. If you think about between 4 and 5, so they're both one unit apart from each other, but look what happens here. The further along the curve you went, or to the right in the domain, the steeper the graph went, and, and you notice that when you graph a parabola by hand, because the, the points start to grow, you know, more and more because of the algebraic square within the formula, right? The square number gets bigger and bigger the further out in the domain you get. So the answer to this one was higher rate of change between four and five. All right. So which of these functions has the greater um, average rate of change between two and three? Well, clearly it's going to be x to the third power. We just talked about this. The higher the power, the greater the numbers are going to get. So like 2 to the third power is 8, but 3 to the third power is 27. Um, here, 2 to the second power is 4, oops, uh, and then 3 to the second power is 9. So you notice the rate of change is not growing by as much to lower the degree. So, uh, find the average rate of change on that boring parabola again throughout these different intervals. So this is kind of fun. And I already did these. Um, I got a table or something on my calculator. But you can set up to put in um, ask mode as opposed to autofill mode. So I'm just going to kind of steal these problem values that I picked up earlier. So here, the ordered pairs that they want me to check out are 1 for the x and 1.1 for the other x. So evaluating this function at 1 and at 1.1, I get, and we're going to have to round a little bit here at some point. So 1, 1, duh. Um, and then 1.21. So finding the average rate of change for this set, um, 1.21 minus 1 over 1.1 minus 1 gives me 2.1. So a similar problem, um, still starting off at a, a value or x value of 1, but the next one, you want a little closer, 1.01. So I already did this. Yes, baby. How do I do this? I learn. All right, so we already figured out that to be 1, 1. And then 1.01 1 .01 plugged in gives me 1.0201. Okay, I don't think I rounded that. That's okay. So calculating the average rate of change here. So this comes out to 2.01. And then I'm going to save a little time and energy. I'm not going to write all these out, but when I evaluated the second point here, I got, oh, I switched my colors up, 1.002001. So going through the calculations again for average rate of change. Oh boy, I get 1.001 minus 1. Gives me 2.001. Question is, what value does the average rate of change appear to be approaching? As you get closer and closer and closer, so that the two ordered pairs aren't so far away, it seems to be approaching 2. And notice when we first started, 2.1, I know to like a lower level math student, they're like, eh, it's practically 2. No, it really, really isn't. It's it's not close to 2, but if you start going further and closer together, 2.0001, eventually it'll approach what we call a limit um, of sorts. So we have been finding the instantaneous rate of change at the value of 2. So when you go on to calculus, the instantaneous rate of change is at a, a particular value. It's going to be very important to you next year. 
All right. So, oh, apparently that's an assignment for you. I have a very strong feeling that I changed that assignment. So don't worry about that. And good luck. We're going to talk more about functions in the next section as well.